Good evening, my name is Nancy Howell. I'm one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And I am totally thrilled this evening because I have one of my favorite artists besides um, the artist that does the, the poster that's behind me. Um, I just love Rosemary's work and I think you will too. So this evening, of course, is Tuesday, October 6th already, and I hope everybody is doing well this, uh, this fall, uh, staying well and healthy. Um, a couple of little housekeeping things, of course, as we always go through. Uh, please uh, make sure you are muted. Um, uh, there's a mute button on my screen. It's down on the lower left. Uh, so keep yourself muted so we don't get background sounds. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, there is also a chat box down at the bottom or a little chat symbol. You can click on that, type in your question, uh, or maybe at the very end we can have some live, uh, some live questions. We will see how things are, are coming along. So we're, again, really pleased to, to have you here this evening. And our speaker series, we started off, uh, oh gosh, it's October already. We started off in September. And of course, we go through, we're going to be going through the rest of the year into 2021, throughout the summer. We don't know how long things are going to be virtual and online. But as long as, uh, again, the COVID-19 hangs around, we want to always be safe. And we hope that you're safe as well, too. Uh, I do want to mention that a number of our board members are, are um, on view. Um, Amanda Sobrowski, maybe Amanda can give a nice wave. There you go, Amanda. Wonderful. Gloria, Gloria, give a nice wave to our visitors here. Wonderful. Karu, Karu Sabone. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, wonderful. Uh, Michelle Brocious, and we'll, uh, many of our, our board members will be mentioning a couple things a little bit later on, but Michelle, hey. Uh, Kurt Miski, I'm not sure if Kurt's on a, a video or not, but hey, Kurt. And I'm not sure if the Romitos are joined in yet. Can see their name yet, but they can. All right, fantastic. And of course, Betsy O'Hagan, who is our platform maintainer and social media maintainer, and does a lot of stuff and gets all these things to together uh, for things that you see here this evening. So, so how did our bird quiz go? Let's see. Our first question was, uh, of course, the national bird of the United States. And maybe, I don't know, everybody got that one? That one is e was an easy one, right? Yeah. All right. Again, you can type into the chat if you'd like. So super easy. How about our northern neighbor, Canada? Gray J, very good, yes. Or Canada J. Um, so that, and that was really, oh, it's one of Rosemary's favorites. That's cool. I've never, I'm trying to think if I've ever run into one. I don't think I've ever run into one. Um, now, let's head south of the border. How about Mexico? I got a couple of little different answers when I was looking things up. As you can see on the flag, there's a golden eagle. But a lot of the people in, uh, in Mexico say that it is the crested caracara. So the citizens or the flag? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't know. We're going to throw both of them in there because I think they're both awesome. All right. How about going over to Great Britain? 
And how about that one? Anybody? Anybody? Ooh, ooh. Let me look at the chat. Let me see. Okay, somebody says Robin. But is that the same Robin that we have here in the U.S.? Hmm. Well, Lily, you're really close. It is the European Robin. I don't know if we've got a nice little photo of the European Robin. Not true, I know, Craig. Yeah, propose. It's not official. Mm. Yeah, but look at that. Look at the European Robin. Look at the American Robin. So the Europeans, uh, people from Britain, come over and they say, "Oh, look at this bird with the rusty red breast," and it looks kind of like um, a robin, doesn't it? Well, there are very, very in very different bird groups. So, so I guess the unofficial national bird of of your of uh, Great Britain is the European Robin and so there we are yay oh my not true leg refers to the Canada J I thought that one had been uh, Craig so we'll have to double check that one out so the robin is correct for for uh, Great Britain, but the gray jay or Canada jay or gray jay, again, somebody's questioning that. Now I'll have to check that one out. All right. So again, I see new folks joining our meeting, and this is wonderful. And uh, just uh, again, real quick, and thank you, Betsy, for those wonderful photos of the birds on our quiz. Yay, thank you so much. Nice round of applause for Betsy for getting those put together. I hope everybody got at least a couple of them right. I hope so. All righty. Uh, let me um, go to our list of things and what's happening. All right. So Michelle, Michelle Grocious will be our next uh, presenter as far as uh, some things that have come that are coming up um, with Western Cuyahoga Audubon. Hi Michelle, yeah. how are you doing? Hi, I'm good, how are you? Good, good. good. Alright, uh, next slide please Nancy or Pepsi, whoever's doing it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, um, so the second Saturday bird walk report, um, I just want to say that in-person activities, including our bird walks, continue to be canceled to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Um, however, Bill Dininger and Dave Grass-Kemper are still going out for the canceled second Saturday bird walks to collect bird survey data for eBird. Um, so a huge thanks to them. Uh, the September 2nd Saturday took place on the 12th and they started the bird walk with finding three warbler species in the parking lot. However, warbler species only totaled four for the entire walk. Uh, they also had great looks at a pair of adult non-breeding scarlet tanagers, and a cooperative great crested flycatcher was chasing insects and gave some good viewing opportunities. They had two rose-breasted grosbeak, and the American goldfinch were abundant at, with an estimate of 40 viewed throughout the walk. In all, 42 species were tallied. All right, uh, next slide, please. Uh, last month, our virtual field trip was at Lake Isaac in Middleburg Heights to see fall warblers and great blue heron. Uh, six participants visited Lake Isaac throughout the month. I am currently compiling the bird lists, journaling, and photos submitted to me into a digital scrapbook. So if you haven't sent me your items, please get those over to me by end of day tomorrow. I will then present the scrapbook at our virtual meetup next week on Wednesday, October 14th at 7 p.m. Even if you didn't have a chance to visit Lake Isaac last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup in which I will share the scrapbook and we can talk about our experiences at the park if anyone has anything additional to share. All right, next slide, please. All right, for this month, October's virtual field trip takes place at Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve. We will be looking again for fall warblers and then also kinglets and sparrows. 
Uh, during your visit, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. You can take photographs to draw a picture or create art inspired by what you've seen, tally identified species, write down your thoughts, create a poem, a haiku, or write down any questions or curiosities about the target species or anything encountered at the location. Send any of these items to me and your contribution will be published to a digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. We will also have an optional virtual meetup uh, for that field trip uh, to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. You can get more information and register for this field trip by visiting our website, wcaudubon.org, and clicking on the October 2020 virtual field trip tile on the home page. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, uh, I just wanted to reiterate our social distancing birding guidelines. Um, as you get out there to bird and enjoy nature during the pandemic, we encourage you to take precautions by limiting your group size to 10 people or less, staying six feet apart from others not in your household, traveling separately, wear a face mask and wash your hands or use a high alcohol hand sanitizer. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you everyone for your attention. Uh, back to you, Nancy. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, I hope a lot of folks head out to Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve. If you have not been there, it is really wonderful for a really a wide variety of birds. So um, really get out there, check out the color. You get a chance to see the lake. There's a beautiful view of the city of Cleveland from one of the points. It is terrific. Uh, Gloria, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing real fine, Nancy. It was a beautiful day, wasn't it? Oh, I just oh, wanted it. Yeah, yeah, you can't, you can't, couldn't beat it with a stick. Yeah. Oh, go right. ahead and share what you have. Okay. Well, the first thing I have is the Guardians of Nature meetings. We still continue to have them two Thursdays a month. This month's meeting will be October 22nd and the 29th. We've had, um, new people at each meeting and we've had people return and um, continue to help us fine tune our events and our programs uh, that we have been giving virtually. So um, we welcome new people, we welcome the uh, people who have been here before. And so let's move on to my next, so just remember October 22nd and 24th and uh, you know, if you have a friend who might be interested, even if they're not a member, um, it doesn't matter. We're trying to find people who are interested in the conservation issues that we have in Northeast Ohio and Ohio um, that are really uh, important to birds and therefore to people. So um, the next thing, Guardians of Bird Nature have been helping us with our Bird of the Month fundraiser and photo contest. It was decided um, <clears throat> this past month that we would separate the fundraiser from the photo contest. So there are two events going to uh, help defray the cost of producing our programming about conservation and making people aware of that. So the fundraising goal is $100 a month. If you give $10 or more, for every $10 you give, you get one ticket. So say if you gave $30, you would get three tickets. These tickets are entered in a raffle that will be held quarterly. Our first quarterly raffle will be at our speakers meeting in December, and I believe that's December 1st. Um, we will have some prizes for people that have given to the monthly. This month, our um, bird of the month is a wood duck. And Nancy Howell has been writing some really great descriptions of our bird of the month. Each month, she has written one for whatever bird it is. Our first bird was red winged blackbird. Last month was. Great blue heron, and this month is woodcock, a uh, wood duck, and um, we also then separated the photo contest. The photo contest is 
in two categories. We have a youth category and we have a adult category. There will be one winner in each uh, category for the month and the contest started the 1st of October and will go on until the 25th of October. Yay. So that our three judges uh, will have time to choose the winning photos and those two winners will be um, <clears throat> they will be announced at November speaker meeting and that will be November 3rd so you know get your camera out and you know you may enter more than one photo but each entry is five dollars so you may just want to choose ask your family which one they think that it has the best chance and put that one in or you may enter as many times as you would like. So um, the third thing I would like to talk about is our book club and September was our first book club and it was really a, a fun time and the recordings of the author interview with Joy Kaiser, America's Other Audubon is the book she wrote, and our book discussion where uh, some of our board members, Michelle and um, Nancy, was our featured speaker about Sand County, Sand County Almanac. Um, Michelle's book was a um, history of the Great Lakes, and the I think it was called The Life and Death of the Great Lakes. And um, it's was very interesting and we had a few other people too. So that second um, meetup is on Sunday is um, everybody joins in and chimes in. The first book club is devoted to our author of the month who is Katie Fallon and she has written several books, but the one that we are going to discuss with her is Vulture, The Private Life of an Unloved Bird. So um, you can click on Guardians of Nature, uh, Bird of the Month Fundraiser and Photo Contest, and the Book Club to get an entry ticket and join us for these fun, entertaining, and informative um, nights that we have scheduled for you. And Nancy, back to you. That's all I have this week. That's all. That's a <laughs> lot. <laughs> That's a lot. And we hope that uh, our visitors, our members, guests, those of you who are joining in this evening, will at least join one of those, the book club, a photography contest. Just Oh, but guess what? We've got a lot more going on. So um, we have a couple of challenges, and one of the challenges is that is still going on is the Fall Warbler Challenge. That started on September 1st and runs in through October 31st, and that is to see as many warblers as you can within the county in which you live. So if you live in this county, Cuyahoga County, you can travel throughout the county but you, uh, and, and find the warblers, but that's where you must stay, just in the county. If you live in Medina County, if you live in Lake County, but that fall warbler challenge, uh, see as, if you can get as many as possible. Uh, we had a mid-challenge event, uh, again, just kind of a rah-rah, getting people excited about this uh, on Friday, October 2nd. We went through the, how the checklist uh, should be filled out. And again, it's the challenge still uh, runs through the end of October. Although, uh, again, the warblers are going to be petering out in a, couple, in a couple weeks. We will have a wrap up on Saturday, November 14th at 3 o'clock. And that should be fun. Uh, again, going over the list of, of, that people have photographs, uh, maybe some mystery warblers that you got a photograph of and you're like, ah, help me identify this. 
So we hope that you can enter that fall warbler brooding challenge. That, that should be pretty fun. And that, again, it, it's not necessarily easy. We want to challenge you with this. And fall warblers are easy. They are easy. Ryan told you he's, they're easy, right? Yes, we're all shaking our heads yes. <laughs> all right. uh, I think we have another slide then of another challenge coming up. Oh yeah, you got to wear these masks. But who wants to wear one that's plain? Check out that photograph. Turn your mask into a bird beak. Now we've got a couple of categories. It can be a real bird, a real species of bird, like a, a bald eagle, or in this case, the young lady has a puffin uh, beak. She's Atlantic puffin, no less. Um, but it can also, you can also choose to do a, a fanciful bird. Uh, I, I have no idea what a beak of a phoenix looks like. So create a phoenix beak. Uh, but you must use the half mask. So the, the, the mask isn't to cover the entire face. It is just to be part of the mask that you would wear. Uh, maybe a few little ornate decorations. I mean, gosh, you can put sparkles on it if you want. You can use you can do pipe cleaners. I don't know. There's just a lot of things out there. And so um, we're going to have you make a mask, uh, submit a photo or a video, and then what's going to be even more fun is our members and guests are going to vote on the, their, on the favorite mask, the mask that they like, and there will be prizes. So we hope that you can, uh, get again, really make it fun. And, you know, with Halloween coming up, who doesn't want to walk around with a mask on then in the shape of a, a bald eagle beak or, a, I don't know, a shoebill stork or who knows what you want to do. So lots and lots, have lots of fun with making a mask. And we have more fun coming up. Uh, the day after Thanksgiving, uh, of course, um, you know, you've eaten a whole lot on Thanksgiving and it's leftovers of the day after and you're like, oh, how about going out for a walk? Well, we're making this a fledgling birding challenge. No, we're not looking for baby birds, fledglings. Fledglings we're putting endearingly are for families, people who may not go out and look at birds. So, so you're a beginner. Maybe you have uh, some, some young people in your family. Maybe you have somebody that's homebound and would like to get out a little bit. So we have a list of 19 species of birds with photographs, like the bird that's in the photo there, Blue Jay. And you know, once you travel around your neighborhood or you know, nearby park and you see that bird, just give it a quick check off. Now, why did I say 19? Because we actually have, want you to find 20 birds, but the 20th bird will be a bird of your choice. So try to get as many of the birds that we've put on our checklist, and you can download that. Again, you can see where, where to, uh, to sign up. And uh, there, there will be um, uh, folks that you know, will look at those, and we'll, we'll have prizes for that as well, too. So fledgling birding challenge. So we've got our mass contest, we've got our warbler contest, we've got our fledgling birding challenge. And uh, in December, of course, we will be doing our Christmas bird count. And the Christmas bird count will go on. Uh, we will be sending out much more information. Nat National Audubon has uh, been sending information to me uh, as the compiler for this area for our circle that um, you know we want to make sure everybody is safe from COVID so there'll be a few little rules and regulations um, but we're still going to go on and our Christmas bird count will be on Sunday December 27th but you'll be getting uh, a lot more information uh, very very shortly. So we've got lots going on as usual, and we still have one more thing coming up. 
Uh, yeah, Amanda, Amanda Sobrowski, who works with our uh, Northeast Ohio Chimney Swift Conservation Society. Hi, um, thanks for that, Nancy. Um, I had planned to repair the two Chimney Swift Towers come October, but I've been sidelined with a shoulder inju injury, so um, Maybe at the end of the month, I'll be able to complete that task. Um, also, an acquaintance of mine has um, asked if we can, if we know of any um, sources of money to repair a chimney on um, old greenhouse property that she bought to save from developers. So I'm waiting for her plans of how she's going to um, ensure that that land is, you know, actually saved. Um, I usually don't like to fund anything unless it's on public land. And also, um, she's getting estimates to see how much it is to fix the tower. So um, that's the newest thing, and I'll have to keep everyone posted when I get more information. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Yep, do well. And... Uh, you know, we we all we want to help those chimney swifts, but right now a uh, little bit of a setback, but not a problem. All righty. As I mentioned earlier, the Christmas bird count as the 121st Christmas bird count. Uh, put it on your calendar. You will be getting a lot more information from me. Uh, we'll have a couple of virtual meetings beforehand, and we'll have our virtual meeting afterward to go over the Christmas bird count lists, uh, rather than having our usual dinner, which I'll miss, but we'll have a great time anyhow. And I don't want to be, uh, uh, be amiss, but I do also want to mention that uh, we accept um, WCAS memberships at any time, even though it's the, it says renewal through August 31st, or uh, I'm sorry, October 31st. Uh, we will accept memberships at any time. So please try to uh, renew your membership, or uh, if you are a new member, thank you so much. Um, and mention it to your friends as well, too, because we've got so much going on. And then next month, we are going to have an awesome speaker. Um, he, We were planning on having this speaker last spring, but of course uh, when COVID hit, we had to uh, change plans a little bit. So Dr. Hunter King uh, from the University of Akron uh, actually studies bird nests and because birds have this ability to choose materials that are just perfect for being flexible, for interweaving with each other, and uh, this is something that in polymer science uh, they're always looking at. So um, again, we're looking at nature and using that for um, human uh, betterment as well too. Uh, biomimicry anyone? So we hope that you can join us and that's Tuesday, November 3rd at 7.30. So I'm looking forward to that one a lot. But this evening, I'm even looking forward, more forward to our presenter, uh, Rosemary Mosco, and I love her comics. They are wonderful, and I just, I'm just going to shut up right now because I would love to just dive into Rosemary and have her tell us a little bit about herself, how she got interested in the in nature, and uh, and then hopefully show a few of the, the fun comics that she's created. Rosemary, we are so happy to have you here. So, hi everybody. I am really, really, really happy to be here. Uh, I'm Rosemary Mosco. I'm a cartoonist and a science communicator. Let me just, uh, sorry, I just got to shrink this window over here. This is some new software for me, so I'm, I'm learning. Um, so I want to start by saying thank you so much to everybody for inviting me to come speak. Um, thank you to Nancy and to Betsy and to the board and everybody 
Um, I really, really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I'm coming at you live from my home range in the Northeast. I can sometimes be found as far south as Florida in the wintertime and sometimes up into Canada during the summer, but typically I'm a little farther east than you. So um, it is kind of amazing that this technology enables me to speak to you from so far away. And um, though that I am fairly far from Ohio, I can tell that if I were uh, in Ohio, we would become immediate friends. And the way I can tell this is uh, here are some of my past Halloween costumes. On the far left, you'll see me when I was pretty little, and I am dressed up like a green-winged macaw. In the middle is a costume of uh, Red Eft, the teenage phase of the Easter Newt. And on the right is a, com uh, a uh, costume from grad school where I was a peregrine falcon um, attacking my friend who is a chickadee. So I now realize from the presentation that this is not one of you. But the fact that you had this image on your website um, just made me so happy. I thought, oh my goodness, these are my people. Um, and I really, really, really want to make a cool animal mask now. Also, I noticed that Nancy had that beautiful Charlie Harper poster behind her. When I give talks, I typically have that exact poster right behind me. Um, due to complicated reasons, I'm actually coming at you from the forest. Uh, there were some coyotes howling earlier, and apparently there may be owls. So um, if you see an owl attack me, please call 911. Uh, so I'm going to start by explaining who I am and what I do. So I mentioned the term science communicator earlier, and that's someone who bridges the gap between science and the public. So I speak with scientists, I figure out what they want people to know. I speak with members of the public and I figure out what they want to know and what they want people to know. And I act as a bridge between these two groups. And that sounds all nice and and fun and helpful, but what on earth do I actually do day to day? Well, it's kind of complicated. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, but the path to science communication is pretty winding um, and is not especially straightforward, um, but it has taken me to some pretty strange and wonderful places. So I've gotten to go out into the field and see some truly incredible creatures like this luna moth and this uh, gopher snake. And I've gotten to do some really fun um, design work. On the far left is an infographic that I made for Mass Audubon. I did not do the art. The art is by John Sill, who is a genius. And I'm going to talk about him a little bit later. In the middle is an Art Nouveau poster of an indigo snake for a great group called the Orient Society that tries to help turtles and snakes and other herps. And on the right is a pint glass for a herpetological society meeting, which was maybe one of the funniest jobs I've ever had and something really fun to put on my resume. I also write a lot of articles. I write for groups like National Audubon. This was a really fun article about uh, bird tracks in snow and how to read them. And I mostly write books. That's uh, my day job when I'm when I'm not making comics. I have a graphic novel about the solar system. I have a collection of my comics and a book called Birding is My Favorite Video Game. I co-wrote the Atlas Obscura Explorer's Guide for the World's Most Adventurous Kid. And on the, on the top right, I have a new book coming out in the spring called Butterflies Are Pretty Gross, which I'm really excited about. It's got all the secrets to how gross butterflies are. Um, and then the dot, dot, dot on the bottom right is that I have a bunch more that I can't talk about yet, but that I'm excited about. But most people know me for my cartoons and my charts. And I put them, oops, I put them online on a site called birdandmoon.com. Now, for those of you who don't know my work, you might wonder, and for those of you who do even, you might wonder why on earth I use bird and moon. And the answer is a little bit convoluted. So back in 2004, I was living in Toronto, Canada. Uh, there's going to be a lot of Canadian content in here, so I was really appreciative of our talk about Grey Jays earlier. And I was working for a great group called FLAP, the Fatal Light Awareness Program, which is a group that tries to stop birds from hitting windows. So take those two things and kind of combine them, 
And I made my very first comic. It was called Bird and Moon. This is just an excerpt from it, and it's about a lonely bird who befriends the moon. And uh, because of that, I bought the domain Bird and Moon to put my comic on. And then ever since then, ever since 2004, I've been putting comics on Bird and Moon. Dot com. So a lot of people think there are two of us, someone named Bird and someone named Moon, and it is just me. So I'm going to share a few of my comics and kind of some themes that I use when I talk about them. Uh, I'm going to talk about comics that are about what it's like to be a naturalist, comics that show love for unloved creatures and um, sometimes unloved habitats too, and comics on helping wildlife. So first off, being a naturalist. So a naturalist is someone who studies and loves a broad range of natural history, and I definitely call myself a naturalist. In fact, I have a degree in it, and I'm going to explain that later. And I love this bumper sticker that I saw at the Texas Butterfly Festival several years ago that says, caution, naturalist on board, will stop for darn near anything, because that's really what it's like. We're just very distractible. And like a lot of naturalists, I love field guides. So see if this sounds familiar. You know, I love field guides. And when I say I love field guides, like I love field guides. I have so many field guides. I have a bookshelf that's entirely field guides. And I use them all the time. And my favorite type of field guide is the kind of field guide that is very specific. The kind that makes people look at my bookshelf and go, huh. So these include books like A Field Guide to the Ants of New England which is by Erin Allison, Elizabeth Farnsworth, and Nicholas Catelli. Uh, one of the ants in the book was only found, I believe, in one of the author's backyards. There's A Field Guide to Clean Drinking Water, which is a book I just got a few months ago. It's really, really, really interesting and amazing by Joe Vogel. There's A Field Guide to Bacteria by Betsy Dexter Dyer, one of my favorites. And Tracks and Sign of Insects and Other Invertebrates by Noah Charlie and Charlie, uh, Noah Charney and Charlie Eisman. And so I started wondering, would it be possible to come up with a field guide that is so obscure that it could not possibly exist? So I made this comment called Field Guides You Will Never See. And it includes these field guides. So mosses through binoculars, hawks from above, trees of Antarctica, birds from that one dream I had, boring leaves, whales from inside, houseplants from outside, and a field guide to field guides of North America. So I thought I was being really, really clever. Uh, but I since learned that two of these are actual field guides. So the first one... So it's not called Hawks from Above. The great Jerry Liguri wrote Hawks from Every Angle, and it includes Hawks from Above, which turns out to actually be really useful when you're at a hawk watch and you're on top of a mountain and you're looking down on the hawks and uh, you're trying to identify them. And then there is actually a field guide to field guides of North America, which is amazing. But... The rabbit hole goes a little deeper. Recently, I've learned of a couple of field guides that I don't own yet that I need, one of which is just a field guide to fields. And then definitely the most meta of all, the field guide to becoming a field guide. So you can come full circle and turn yourself into a field guide. So I'm going to look at another comic about being a naturalist. So like a lot of naturalists, I take a lot of nature photos. And, you know, sometimes they even turn out okay. I am not a professional, but here are a few that I thought were pretty fun. There's a muskrat, a uh, coral hair streak, a paddle caterpillar, my very first, and this um, beautiful white-faced ibis. And so those were the ones that I really got lucky with because often – they are not so good. And speaking of Canada Jays, a month or two ago I went to Maine to try to find Canada Jays. And I took this spectacular photo. Um, oh my goodness, there are coyotes howling. I really hope you can hear this. This is so wonderful. Ah, oh, what a good backdrop. Okay, so uh, take a look and see if you can find my Canada Jay. It is there, and not my greatest photo. I uh, tried taking pictures of an oven bird earlier this spring. I'm just trying to start taking pictures of warblers. 
And I'm going to warn you, the following photo contains a lot of cloaca and may not be suitable for all viewers. So if that's not your kind of thing, mm. um, I'm going to warn you before I show you. So, so in three, I'll show you this photo. So three, two, one. Okay. So in this photo, you can see that the oven bird is pooping. And I caught it at exactly the moment that it was pooping which is fascinating from a biological perspective, but maybe not the best photo that I've ever taken. And I know that I'm not actually alone because there's a Facebook group called Crap Wildlife Photography whose slogan is hit us with your worst shot. And they take some truly terrible photos, some of which uh, I asked for permission to share with you. This one is by Max Wurr. And of course you can tell that this is a Eurasian hobby, a falcon that's native to Europe and Asia. It's, it's absolutely evidently clear. This one by Jess Owen. How many of us have photos of a perch and a bird taking off and not showing its full body? And then this one by Johan Berger or Berger always cracks me up. I'm going to zoom in on this particular part here. Johan has discovered a new species, some sort of a zip zebraf. And this is this is I think a good bad wildlife photo. So I made this comment called a guide to bird photography. And on the left you'll see the photo you want and on the right you'll see the photo that you're actually going to get. So on the left we've got a well framed shot and on the right you're actually going to get an action shot. You're going to want a bird in sharp focus, but you're going to get just exquisite detail on those leaves. You're going to want a striking portrait. Um, I love seeing photos that where people try to take pictures of raptors and they're being mobbed, in this case by a western kingbird, and so they don't get their beautiful image. And then on the left is pure elegance, which is what you want, and what you get is uh, maybe I can fix this in post. I highly recommend you go on YouTube and search for photos of uh, great blue herons pooping because they often land on people's houses and look really majestic and people start filming them and then they poop to lighten the load before they take off and it is really funny. So I'm going to share a comic I made on the theme of love for the unloved which is something I do a lot of. I do a lot of comics about snakes and bugs. Um, but I'm going to talk about probably my best known comic, which is one of my oldest at this point. So friends will often send me pictures like this. And they're very excited. They say, is this an eagle? Did I get a picture of an eagle? But of course they didn't. They got a picture of a turkey vulture or some other vulture. And my friends are inevitably sad about this. But they shouldn't be. Because vultures are so cool. You know, without vultures, we would be knee deep in roadkill. They provide this invaluable um, ecosystem service. And they can also be really, really cute. There are lots and lots of photos online of uh, black vultures preening, or it's called aloe preening, grooming um, caracaras. And there are so many of these, and it's so cute, and nobody knows why they do it. They do it in the wild and in captivity, and I just think it's adorable. So here's a comic I made uh, about vultures. It says, I am a turkey vulture. Yes, indeed. My head is bare to prevent rotting fresh flesh from adhering to it. To keep cool, I poop on my legs and feet. My main defense is projectile vomiting. I am so awesome. So I just love vultures. And I'm excited that you're reading that book about vultures in your book club. I have not read it yet. It's on my list. I also make a lot of comics about helping wildlife. So I'm going to talk about a very new comic that I just put out uh, last week. I mentioned that I worked for a group called Flap Canada back in 2004. Um, just doing a time check. And... Um, Flap works to stop birds from hitting windows, and this is a pretty serious problem. Uh, worldwide, an estimated, you know, several billion birds die a year. In the United States, it could be up to a billion. Um, there are all sorts of complicated reasons why they hit windows. They hit both during the night and during the day, but Flap has been more and more focusing on daytime strikes, which seem to be more serious. 
And the reason that birds hit windows is that, during the day at least, is that they're just looking for a safe place to land. And our windows are so incredibly perfectly reflective that they see what they think is a really good place to hang out and be safe. So back when I worked for FLAP, people used to say, well, why don't birds just evolve to not hit windows? Which is kind of a misunderstanding of evolution. But also, I just kept thinking, who among us has not walked into a window? I definitely have. And lots and lots and lots of us do. And it's to the point where, and I don't recommend you look these up, but there are endless compilations on YouTube of people walking into windows. This happens all the time. So we are not immune even from walking into these things that we ourselves have created and used. And, you know, a lot of us who love birds worry that people just don't care, but I found that a lot of people really do care genuinely, but they're getting some bad information. So they put hawk decals up, decals that look like this, but these really don't work. You know, the birds see them as a barrier, but they don't see them as a hawk. So all the green and blue space all around this hawk, they'll think, well, I can just fly around that barrier and go there. Um, and okay, I lied. They do actually work, but they work if you space them like this, which I think might make your neighbors a little worried about you. Maybe not during Halloween. Maybe if you put up bats, you'd be okay. But you really have to space these things really close. Luckily, there are some really good solutions. Um, this uh, bird scientist named Heidi, who tweets at Just Save Birds, sent me these pictures of, I believe, her office. And you can see on the left is a photo of the outside and on the right is a photo from the inside and they look really good. And this is pretty much all you need to make sure that birds don't hit your windows. So I made this comic with Flap and I put it online a, about a week ago and I'm not going to read through the whole thing because it's pretty long. Um, but if you want tips for um, helping birds not hit windows, you can check out this comic or you can go to flap.org. They have so much useful information. I did want to mention some more Canadian content here. Flap really wanted me to use a Canada warbler because uh, they're from Canada. So there's a little sneaky Canadian patri patriotism in there. So how did I become a nature cartoonist and why did I think that this was a good idea? Well, I grew up in Ottawa, Canada, thus all the Canadian content. This is a place that has ca uh, canals cutting through the city, and the canals freeze over in the winter, and you can skate. I used to skate to school. My high school was way in the back there, um, almost in view in this picture. And from an early age, I knew that I loved science, and I loved art, and I especially loved biological science and art. So I would go out and I would feed the black capped chickadees at the nature park and then I would read tons and tons of comics, especially newspaper comics. So everything from The Far Side to Calvin and Hobbes to Bloom County to For Better or For Worse. And I made my own comics too. So here is a comic that I made of my parakeet, um, dreaming that one day it will become a majestic ostrich. Here's a truly terrible one that I made. Uh, it's a unicorn, and he's telling his horse girlfriend, what did I do wrong, honey? You're acting as though I never existed. And I couldn't spell your, and I also had a lot of trouble spelling existed. I just wrote over it, it looks like, over and over. So I loved both science and art, and I kind of dreaded the moment when I had to pick one of the two of them. Because people often see science and art as being in opposition. You know, kids have more and more, there's more of a, of a combo, but kids typically have science class and art class. And you can be a scientist or an artist, but there's nothing really in between. And this is reflected when you Google art and science. You get images like this, where the brain is split into two halves, one of which is sciency and one of which is just a just a mess with a lot of fonts and a lot of colors. And this is not actually how the brain works, but if you search for this, you'll get image after image after image that says you have to pick one side or the other, and these are two sides. Sometimes you get images that show a tiny bit of overlap. But in this case, it's just sort of a galaxy or a nebula, and it says wonder. 
And I really don't know how to become a wonderologist who lives in a nebula. Um, so it's a nice sentiment, but uh, maybe not as helpful as I would want. So when I was an undergrad in college, I went to my advisor and I said, okay, we have to pick a major and we have to pick a minor. Can I, you know, major in science and minor in art? This shouldn't be too difficult. But my advisor said, absolutely not. He said, our school is not set up to do this. And I was really sad. And what's funny is that since then, my college has actually started doing a Bachelor of Arts in Science that's very much designed, you know, programs. So there has been progress. But way back when I was in school, this was not an option. And I was pretty sad. But what it took me a while to learn is that there is actually a really long-standing precedent for combining science and art. And people have been doing it for tens of thousands of years. So this is one of my favorite stories. So this critter is Megaloceros giganteus, the Irish elk. This is a tremendous, um, huge antlered critter that lived between about 420,000 years ago to about 7,700 years ago. And we have skeletons of this critter. Ooh, now I'm hearing who cooks for you, which is a barred owl. Oh. So wonderful. So if we look at the skeleton, we can tell that Megaloceros giganteus was big. I mean, look at it compared to a moose. It was a big, big, big critter. And that's cool. But what did it actually look like? Well, we can guess what it looked like. You know, we can take that skeleton and we can look at critters that exist now and we can say, okay, well, maybe this is what they look like. Um, you know, just add a little fur and add some meat and, and draw these critters. And you get some beautiful art, you know, on the left, the famous Charles R. Knight, just beautiful art. But the problem is, this is not actually what these critters look like. And we know because we were there. So we have accurate science art from humans who saw this animal. And it's in the form of cave art. This is 25,000-year-old cave art from the Grotte de Cognac in France. And if you look, you'll see that not only are these really beautiful paintings, but there's some weird features on them. Um, there's a dark hump with these two dark stripes coming off of, of both of these animals. And these are not the only paintings that we have of Irish elk. So Mark Witten, who is a really wonderful artist, has done this illustration of the Irish elk based on basically with a collaboration with people who lived 25,000 years ago in France. And he's created this, this accurate reconstruction. And I think it's incredible that there's this partnership across tens of thousands of years based on accurate science art. And there are lots and lots of other examples. I'm just going to share a couple of my favorite ones. So this is from 1596. And it's a piece of science art depicting something that you use every day. So take a second try to think what is this an illustration of the fish are a bit of a red herring pun intended um, so those ignore the fish this here is a flush toilet it's Sir John Harrington's very first diagram of a flush toilet and fun fact Sir John Harrington is actually a relative of Kit Harrington from Game of Thrones which I think is kind of great you should use that at your next party Here's another spectacular piece of science and art. And if you look closely, and this one's from 1610, you'll notice that this is a cartoon. So it changes from the top down through time with all of these different panels showing this art through time. So try to guess what you think this is. And if you're thinking something space themed, you're on the right track. So, um, we're going to uh, look at a photo now of what was going on here. This is Galileo's drawings of Jupiter's moon. So Jupiter has four large moons and many, many small moons. And we now know those moons as the Galilean moons. And if you look up at Jupiter with binoculars, you will notice um, these four moons are visible. And using this science cartoon, essentially, Galileo was able to figure out that the world doesn't revolve around us, that there are other planets that have their own things that revolve around them. And that was a, a really earth-shaking um, earth discovery. 
And of course, the world of ornithology has so much beautiful art. Elizabeth Gould on the left, um, doing tons of art to support her husband, John Gould, an incredible ornithologist. Elizabeth Gould really deserves more credit. The Gouldian Finch is named after Elizabeth Gould, not John Gould. She was brilliant. Mark Catesby on the right. You know, this art is art you could put on your wall, but it's also very important scientifically. And, you know, I'm focusing a lot on visual art, and I know that that's um, that's a mistake that I make because it's not just visual art, of course. Um, so Mary Oliver is America's best-selling poet, sadly passed away, I think, a year or two ago. Um, she's really brilliant and does this very accurate writing. And there are so, so many more different arts, you know, dance and cooking and crafts and all kinds of just incredible stuff that people do that's science art. So I really like this quote by Einstein. He says, after a certain high level of technical skill is achieved, science and art tend to coalesce in aesthetics, plasticity, and form. The greatest scientists are always artists as well. So I learned that it's not so much, you know, this great big science and art, um, you know, being very different from each other, but in fact, there's an overlap. And in fact, I would say it's almost entirely an overlap. Art and science really reinforce and help each other. And I had a hunch that this mix could work as a career. But it took me a while to get there, and that's not really uncommon. So this is my most wordy slide. But I really like this quote when I was mentioning earlier that it's kind of a winding road becoming a science communicator. So science writer Ch Stephanie Chastain describes it, and she says, bacteria thermophilic, that's bacteria that like it warm, or acidoph acidophilic, that's bacteria that like it acidic, um, for example, do not know that the hot spot or acidic island is over there. They have no overall map of their surroundings to direct their movement in a straight line towards what they seek. What they sense instead is a local gradient, a small change right next to them. It's a little warmer that way. They move slightly. They feel it out again. It's a somewhat jagged but non-random path towards the thing that they love, and so is mine, which is really, really, really true. And there's one group of people who really exemplify this kind of winding road and this wild mix, and it's naturalists. And, you know, people like Rachel Carson, who wrote... Um, you know, uh, Silent Spring, but also Under the Sea Wind and a whole lot of other books. Um, and people like Kate Furbish, who was up in Maine collecting and, and drawing rare plants and even has a plant, the Furbish's lousewort, named after her. So I really decided that the naturalist vibe was what I, what I wanted to be. And I know that I don't live in the 1800s and 1700s anymore, so I couldn't figure out how to be one, but I knew I wanted to be one. Oh, there's a bug on my glasses. Hello, small friend. Goodbye. So Kate Furbish, I just wanted to share, because this is some life goals here. This is a story in 18, uh, from 1892 in the Chicago Tribune about Kate Furbish. And it says, Miss Kate Furbish, Maine's botanist, has traveled thousands of miles over that state in connection with her flora of Maine. She generally travels alone, carries no weapons, and says that she has not, in her 20 years of experience, encountered anything to be afraid of. So imagine 20 years no fear. She's just in the woods. Incredible. So I did what any nerd would do. I googled naturalist and graduate program and I found one. I found the field naturalist and ecological planning program at the University of Vermont and it only takes about nine people a year but I got in. I was the RC person that particular year. On the bottom left is me graduating. They gave us a shovel so we could dig our own soil pits when we graduated. And I got to go out and do a lot of field science. You know, anyone who's done botany knows the, the pain of, of crouching down and looking at tiny parts of ferns. But I also got to do a lot of art. This is some art that I did for a geology class. There's a really terrible pun in the comic on the left. It says, uh, this trilobite cryptolithus says, to his friend Isotelus, hey Isotelus, what's your favorite type of rock? And Isotelus says, sedimentary, my dear cryptolithus. My geology teacher appreciated it. It's okay if you don't. So I tried a whole bunch of different media, but I just kept coming back to comics. And that's because comics can be really funny and nature can be really funny too. You know, birds can go from majestic to silly incredibly quickly. 
And you can use that humor to spread a love of nature. So when I was in sixth grade, I was at a friend's house for a sleepover, and I really, really, really hated sleepovers. I could never get enough sleep. I always woke up in the middle of the night feeling, you know, uncomfortable and missing my mom. And so the way I coped was I would read books that uh, my friend would have in their bookshelves. And one day I was at this friend's house in sixth grade, and I found that they had a field guide that I had never seen before. It was really two field guides. And I thought this was really strange because at the time I thought I had read every birding field guide that was out. I mean, there weren't that many. But here are the two field guides that I saw at my friend's house. Now, I mentioned John Sill earlier. He's the illustrator here. So this is a field guide to little known and seldom seen birds of North America and another field guide to seldom seen birth America. Exquisite art, beautiful design. So I dove right in and there were birds that I had never heard of before. So this here is the screamer tit. It uh, screams in order to hatch out of its egg. <clears throat> this here is a circular dove. Circular doves have one leg shorter than the other. And males and females have different legs that are shorter than the other. So breeding success is rare because they have to um, make uh, clockwise and counterclockwise circles that actually meet in the middle. So very slowly I realized that actually these books were humor. They were meant to be humor. And that's why they were at my friend's house. Um, and that's really powerful, you know, because even though these books were not real field guides, the fact that the joke of a field guide was in my friend's house world with humor. So I put all of these things together and I started making some comics. And this is when I let you in on two of the secrets of comics. One of which is that comics are not just for kids. So people very often pick up Birding is My Favorite Video Game and they say, oh, you know, my eight-year-old will like this. And I really, really appreciate that because I love giving workshops to kids and chatting with kids. But I'm not thinking necessarily of just kids when I'm making comics. There are totally lots of comics for kids. I grew up with Betty and Veronica, so I'm kind of dating myself. And kids these days are into stuff like Dogman or Captain Underpants. But some comics are very much for adults, and some are serious journalism and history. So on the left, we've got Mouse, which is Art Spiegelman's uh, books about the Holocaust, really powerful, maybe not for little kids. March on the right was co-written by John Lewis. It's a trilogy, and it is about the civil rights uh, struggle. It's really, really powerful, pretty intense stuff. And secret number two is that you probably read comics all the time. And everyone probably reads comics all the time, no matter what they think about comics. And no, I'm not just talking about your relative on Facebook who is always sharing political comics and everybody always gets mad. I think it's pretty funny on the bottom left here. I hid the comic just because I knew it would enrage someone in the audience. But on the bottom left, the reactions are someone laughing and someone enraged. <laughs> So, you know, don't be that person. But what I mean is things like this. So when you get on an airplane, you are handed a comic book. It's in the seat back pocket in front of you. And the point of this comic book is to make you stay safe in case of an emergency. Now, there's no words in this comic book, but it's very much in comic book form. And that's because the format of a comic book is so incredibly powerful that we're using it for this very important function. Similarly, I'm assuming you have Ikea in Ohio. I've been surprised at the places where I, uh, Ikea is and isn't. Uh, but, you know, whether you have Ikea or some other furniture store, you'll get instructions that are in the shape of a comic book. And they're not very funny, and maybe you're not super thrilled to have them. But again, that's the power of the comic book. And comics really are everywhere, and they can help people learn and find more joy in the world. You know, we all learn in different ways, so comic books can be a really interesting way to try and learn. So in the last little bit of my talk here, I'm going to give you some tips for making your own nature comics, and I really encourage you to do this. And if you do, please send me the comics that you make, because I would love to see them. 
if you follow my instructions, you too can make ten thousand years uh, ten thousand dollars a year. I love this because you know the um, there's been inflation, you know, and 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 the value of ten thousand dollars has changed a lot, you know. But it's possible you could make about ten thousand dollars today in in comics. So the very first thing is to think really broadly before you even start drawing something silly. Think about what your goal is and what you really most want to communicate. What's important to you? You know, you have your own gifts and your own goals and, and your own cares. So these should be things like my study species deserves more love, environmental and human causes are linked, take action, here's how, and you know, even just telling people there's hope. And then you can generate ideas. And this is the part that I find the hardest because uh, it's really hard for me to try to come up with cool ideas for comics. I have lots of facts, but it's hard to come up with something that would be funny. So here are some tips to turn on the lights of inspiration and attract the moths of creativity. And I don't know if you've been seeing, but I've been attracting a few moths here, which I'm, I'm very happy about. So step one is go birding. And when people ask why you're birding, tell them, well, it's research. So it's almost time for me to start looking for rough-legged hawks. They come down to my area in the wintertime. They're really spectacular hawks that, and, you know, I'm guessing that y'all have the same situation with uh, rough-legged hawks coming down in the winter. And they come in a lot of beautiful color morphs. On the left is a pale morph, on the right a dark morph. So I made this comic called a rough guide, uh, a guide to rough-legged hawk morphs, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but there's some serious ones that are the real hawk morphs, and then there's some silly ones like the backlit morph and the camel morph. But the one I was proudest of was the wharf morph. So I grew up a huge trekkie, and um, it's hard to see in this image, but I drew the the ridges on the brow of uh, wharf on my wharf morph. Um, rough-legged hawk, and I have the right number of pips on his collar. So these are the these are the details that are very important when you're making these ridiculous nature cartoons. Another tip is to hang out with other birders and to go to birding festivals. So a few years ago, I went to the LL Bean Maine Audubon Birding Festival, and I met. Laura Erickson for the very first time and I was starstruck. She is a birder and a radio star, science editor and author and just an all-around birding genius. And she was telling me about how sometimes people mispronounce bird names. And she was telling me especially that people will sometimes see a pileated woodpecker and they'll say, oh that's a pleated woodpecker. Or they'll look at a roughed grouse and they'll say, oh a ruffled grouse. So with her permission, I made this cartoon based on some of these misheard birds of North America, and they include the ruffled grouse, the pleated woodpecker, the mourning dove, the greater and lesser scope, and the buffalo head. Uh, the buffalo head, the duck, is, the name actually comes from buffalo. And, uh, oh, there's some, some interesting sounds happening. I'm not sure what. Um, hopefully I'm not about to be attacked by a raccoon, but if I do, you will get it on video. So I kind of created a monster with this, this frame here. There's a uh, morning dove is standing on this, um, this cup that says Mondays can kiss my cloaca. And I, it was just a silly throwaway joke that I made, and I really don't ever make this with the intent to make money. But um, someone wrote to me, actually a, a bunch of people wrote to me, and they wanted this mug. So I made this mug that says, Mornings Can Kiss My Cloaca. And I really didn't expect people to then go ahead and buy it, but biologists are buying it, and it really <laughs> helps me feel like I'm less alone. Um, now... Oh, I can hear somebody on the call uh, might need to mute their, their camera. I hear a little kid. Hello, little kid. So now I'm moving on to um, just a couple quick notes about writing. So writing is not just about sharing facts. 
you know, there's this idea called the inf information or comprehension deficit model. And it's basically that to fix the world, you just need to give people more facts and teach them to think scientifically. And it's kind of like that old Far Side cartoon. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but the one where the kid has a really small head and he says, Maybe, may I be excused, my brain is full. So it's this idea, your brain is empty, we got to fill it up. But we know that this does not actually work, and we've known this for decades. In America, science You continue to argue um, if you learn more science. So what are we supposed to do with that as people who care about nature? Well, we need to recognize that we basically are not beings of pure rationality and facts, that we all make decisions based on, you know, feelings and values and emotions and all kinds of other stuff, too. And that's totally okay. That's something I think that's really beautiful about us. So I think that we have to not just share from share facts but also share from the heart. So Catherine Hayhoe, one of my favorite climate scientists says, it was a complete breakthrough for me to realize that sharing from the heart, which is the opposite of what we're taught to do as scientists, was the way for me to connect with people and then after that connection share from the head. A couple quick notes on art. Um, if you're going to start birds, drawing birds, start here with the Law's Guide to Drawing Birds. I recently took a class through California Audubon with John Muir Laws. Absolutely incredible. Choose your tools. The options are limitless. I use kind of a setup that's like the bottom right there. I use a drawing tablet and I use Photoshop. But there are lots of cartoonists who use watercolors or who use inks. I'll sometimes use inks. You really can use anything. Now, what if you can't draw or you don't want to? Well, don't worry about it because you're okay. No need to be intimidated. You can use photos and put speech bubbles on those. I've done that. You can collaborate with an artist or just try using very, very simple drawings because comics are not scientific illustration. You know, in the comic world, sim simplicity is actually strength, and it helps make our work more relatable. So the great Scott McCloud, who wrote a book called Understanding Comics, which is all about how to understand comics, explains that if you look at this, this, this picture on the left of this face that's very detailed, you won't look and say, oh, that's me. But if you look at a smiley face, it's so loose that you can look at yourself and you can say, you can look at it and you can see yourself. So the simplicity really is power. And if you make comics about birds, you will not be alone. You will be joining an enormous flock because there has recently been a revolution in bird comics. And I'm going to share a few comics that I think you should read, but there are many, many, many more. So one of my favorites is False Knees. And I mentioned watercolors earlier. False Knees, it's all hand-drawn, all with watercolors. It's beautiful, so funny. I cannot get enough of this comic. So in this one, um, it says, this blue jay says, some say I'm really vain about my looks, but I'm also clever and hilarious. So falsenews.com, one of my favorites. Chuck Draws Things is also a comic that I really, really like. Um, this is a comic about pigeons, but it's really about anxiety, and she uses pigeons to kind of talk about this anxiety. So this pigeon says, Hmm, I haven't had any strong feelings for a while. Is that normal? Should I be worried? What if I never feel anything again? Oh, God, oh, God, what do I... Oh, wait, there it is. <laughs> Which I think is pretty relatable. For those of you with pet birds, I recommend Chicken Thoughts. Twitter is at Chicky Thoughts, and they're so funny, so simple and so funny. So this cockatiel on the left says, I always make the human chase me when they want to trim my nails so they can't do it. The other one says, that works? Hmm. So good. So I feel really privileged to be a part of this flock. And, you know, making comics online um, for a public audience can feel really vulnerable sometimes. It's a very isolating hobby and, you know, then I put stuff out and I wait to hear feedback. And it can be kind of scary. 
But it's all really, really, really worthwhile to me if I help someone save an animal or just understand it better or if I help make a wildlife rehabilitator's job easier because wildlife rehabilitators are just such unsung heroes. If any of you are rehabilitators, thank you so much. And it's also all worthwhile when I get to talk to a big group of people like you. So thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me to talk again. Thank you. I'm hoping Banana you're hearing me applause. I'm hoping you're hearing me applause. Yay. No, um, no, I'm not. Thank you, thank you. here. Um, amazing. I'm just, you know, thank you so much. More applauses. Yes. I think that one, if somebody has a question or two, um, oh, somebody from Southern California. How about that? Um, oh but if goodness. somebody has a question, oh, wow. you can put it in the, in the chat. Uh, I just wanted to mention that the reason I contacted you is I was watching some wild turkeys in my backyard. And you have a cartoon of male wild turkeys, and they're just talking. And I guess they're a little thought bubble. And about, oh, you have a crush on this female turkey. Oh, no, 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 no. And along comes the female turkey, and the ma one male just poof, poofs up. You, you, you know that cartoon, <laughs> right? Because that is exactly what I saw in the backyard. Several male wild turkeys. Female comes through. One of them just poof, just poofs himself up. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> she knows it. So you know, it was wonderful. Um, the, a question is, uh, are you a fan of Roz uh, Ch uh, Oh, Chas? Roz Chan. Mm -hmm. Yes, she's amazing. Oh, she's so incredible. I, one time I was at a comic festival and she had a table opposite, like across the hall from me, or, like, or across the, uh, I don't know what you call it, the aisle. And I was just, she she had a giant lineup and I could never get anywhere near her, but I was just Aww. so obsessed. She's really incredible. She has this kind of wiggly style, but she's just so so funny. Yeah, she's done New York Times comics. She's pretty famous. I love her. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any other questions coming in, but we want to thank you again for your time and and being outdoors with coyotes and things prowling <laughs> around in the woods. Um, so, well, thank you. Yeah, could you hear the could you hear the coyotes? I think they were pretty quiet. No, probably. Yeah, no, could, I think couldn't, probably I couldn't hear them. Maybe maybe other people have better better uh, yeah. uh, audio. Don't know. Yeah, but we thank you so much. This was wonderful.